Okay, well, let me get started on the conversation. Um, I want to bid everyone a good afternoon. I'm Deborah Van Ayneton from the Department of Political Science and North American Studies at Wilfrid Laurier. And I'm co-lead along with my partner here, Neil, Crime, uh, Neil Craig from the University of Waterloo School of Environment, Enterprise and Development. And um, we are leads for the Environment and Resources Research Cluster at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Um, and we've had a number of uh, events over the course of this academic year. Um, and, and actually I'm starting to think that while I, you know, I love to meet in person and I really miss that, it's really wonderful. <laughs> it's really wonderful that um, we can actually get people together on a more regular basis. And I think we get good feedback and good participation because people can just log on. It is my great pleasure today, though, on behalf of the ERRC to host Professor Miguel Siu, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Laurier, for a conversation about advancing Indigenous environmental stewardship. And what I would like to do today is really to use Miguel's new book, which is called Indigenous Geographies of the Yucatan, Learning from Responsibility-Based Maya Environmental Ethos, as a springboard to discuss Indigenous knowledges, Indigenous worldviews on interrelationships between land, human, and other than humans, and their application to how we approach environmental management. And so what I, I uh, suggested to Miguel is, Miguel is that um, he speak for about eight to 10 minutes on the book and just briefly outline for us what he was trying to achieve in the book and sort of the top three takeaways in terms of findings. And then I, I was hoping to engage with Miguel in some back and forth on the book. Um, but I want to integrate in along the way any questions that participants in the Zoom meeting today have. So put your questions in the chat as soon as you can, as soon as they pop into your head. And I'm really going to try to uh, to kind of integrate them into our discussion here today. So Miguel, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. So tell us a little bit about the book and, and help us start the conversation. Sure, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Deborah, for uh, organizing this event. Um, and uh, it's it's I mean a, a great pleasure for me to uh, to be here uh, with all of you today. I mean, virtually, but uh, to talk about my new book and um, some of the things I've learned in my, I guess, my my young academic uh, career, you could say, and uh, some of the lessons that I, I, I took from this PhD research, which um, this, this book is a, a result of, really, and how I'm uh, moving that forward in my, my current research projects. Uh, so maybe before I talk about the book, maybe I'll say a few words about about me, you know, who I am and uh, my cultural background and how that informs my research approach, even the very research questions that are central to uh, this book and to my, my PhD research in this case. Um, so again, my name is Miguel Siwi. I'm a Huron Wandat geographer and environmental studies scholar. Uh, so I'm a member of the Huron Wandat First Nation. I've grown up in a very traditional Wandat family, you could say, you know, so I've had role models like my, my father and my grandmother, Eleanor Siwi, the late Eleanor Siwi, who was the first or one of the first Indigenous women in Canada to obtain a PhD. And my father is uh, the first First Nations academic historian, so the first First Nations person to obtain a PhD in history uh, in Canada, you know, so they've been role models and an inspiration for me throughout my career. And they're the ones who passed down this knowledge, this one dot knowledge and these traditions that I, I, I valorize and that I hold so dearly, you know, and that I cherish and that inform every dimension, every aspect of my life, of, including, of course, my research approach. Um, so just just like the Maya people, the Wandat people and all peoples in the Americas, all indigenous peoples in the Americas and around the world really, uh, have had a very harsh experience with colonialism as, you're, as you all know, I'm sure. And so um, we've had similar challenges when we're considering the Maya people and the Wandat and my ancestors as well. Uh, very similar challenges and encounters with colonialism and with, um, with uh, European colonizers a few centuries ago. And, you know, of course, these legacies um, have continued uh, 
to the present day. And so as an indigenous geographer, uh, very deeply rooted in my Huron Wanda traditions, I bring perhaps another perspective to indigenous geographies than, than maybe a, a non-indigenous geographer uh, would. And so this has informed my approach to research and also what I'm interested in really. I approach these things from a slightly different perspective and I'm, I'm gonna talk a bit more about that as well in the context of my, my book. Um, so about the book, so this research project sought to document, interpret and elaborate a synthesis of the current state of the uh, Yucatec Maya environmental ethos and land use knowledges in one particular existing Maya community, which is uh, Shuilub. It's right on the border of Yucatan and uh, Quintana Roo in the state in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, so I have some research questions that were central to my project and also my, my analysis of the research findings. And so these questions are, what are the spiritual and or cultural motivations behind Maya individuals personal relationships with the land? What is the Maya environmental ethos as manifested in the Ejido or the village of Shuilub? How might it be influencing these Yucatec Maya individuals present day relationships with the land? Is this ethos consistent between different individuals in Shuilub? And also, are there discernible trends with regard to their understanding, their personal understanding of this Maya uh, land ethos. So in other words, I was interested in investigating uh, the current state of a uh, Yucatec Maya community's land use knowledges and practices as part of a broader integrated cultural environmental ethos from an indigenous scholar's perspective, from a Northern indigenous scholars, uh, scholars perspective using an indigenous research approach and framework. And so not in relation to Eurocentric or Western notions of place, uh, linear time, progress, development, and also importantly, uh, rights or justice, which as I'll uh, discuss a bit later on are historically foreign to the Americas. You know? So I, tr I try to avoid these terms, these concepts that are foreign to indigenous peoples of the Americas as much as was possible during this research and through my interactions with my Maya research partners in Shuilub. So I was trying to bring in very broad terms, uh, an indigenous approach and perspective to this research and to avoid considering and trying to understand Maya land use knowledges in relation to Western knowledges or Western uh, concepts about the environment and about place and time and progress as I was explaining. So first of all, I want to define responsibility-based thinking because that's part of the title of the book. So learning from the responsibility-based uh, Maya land ethos. So I define responsibility-based thinking as an indigenous cultural ethic that informs and mediates personal and collective conduct by instilling in an individual and by extension, a community, a sense of duty or responsibility uh, toward their human and other than human relations. So that's a, you know, a very broad, very simple definition. Hopefully it'll be helpful and gives you a little bit more context in terms of what I mean by responsibility-based thinking. So I've learned through my interviews and my interactions with the people of, of Shuilub uh, that indigenous land-based activities, these Maya land-based activities, such as milpa farming, apiculture, cattle ranching, and hunting, for instance, are all, um, are all informed by this responsibility-based approach and ethics. And this continues to be practiced in the Yucatan and it's manifested on a day-to-day -day basis in these land use activities. So the way that the Maya of Shuilub view and interact with uh, their natural environment in the Yucatan corresponds to these broader cultural frameworks, these ethical or moral frameworks that I've been describing. So through this research, I learned that the community's land use uh, management, land use and management attitudes are possibly best understood under an epistemological lens that is described as responsibility-based thinking. So one elder uh, taught me a, a Maya phrase, you know, that encapsulates this idea of responsibility quite beautifully, actually. So uh, the phrase is in kushtal helum ma, uh, which means the land is my life and I owe everything to her. Uh, 
you know, so I owe everything to her. This, this, um, this means it, it, it means a certain responsibility or duty to the land and one's relations with all elements of the land, you know, so humans and other than human beings, including landscape features like pyramids in the Yucatan or cenotes. So these um, underground, uh, these sinkholes that are filled with potable water. So these landscape features are also part of the land and also part of the great circle of peoples in the Yucatan, this, this Maya idea of a greater democracy, unlike the democracy that we have here in a Western um, political state like Canada uh, that only includes human beings. You know? So it, what I've learned in the Yucatan is that there's this broader understanding or meaning related to democracy and what it means to be part of a society. Um, and it's really brings into question notions, Western notions of citizenship and belonging, and as I said, society and democracy as well. So the, that's one of the main things that I learned throughout this research. So according to this responsibility-based philosophy, a person is responsible for their actions on earth. And in that sense, there's no ontological uh, primacy in the case of human beings, there's no notion of, of humankind's primacy over other beings of the land. All elements of the ecosystem are thought to be a part of this great circle of peoples of the Yucatan. So this mindset inspires um, responsibility-based thinking and action rather than rights-based thinking. So in a country, in a society like Canada, in a democracy like Canada, a so-called democracy like Canada, we relate to one another in these rights-based terms, under rights-based definitions, according to uh, the Constitution Act, say, in Canada. So what is interesting from this research is that since I avoided using these terms, you know, like rights and justice and uh, things that were brought over from another continent that belong to another culture that has had a completely different experience and cultural trajectory to the indigenous cultures of the Americas, it was quite interesting to find that not one person mentioned this notion of rights or injustice or justice or rights-based thinking in any, uh, really in, in any um, definition of that, according to any definition of that. Uh, what did come up time and again was this notion of responsibility to one's relations on the land and this sense of belonging to uh, the land and the earth as one's mother, you know, which is very similar to the one dot term yatenoha, which means our earth mother, you know, so this phrase in Maya that I learned in Kushtal Heluma, the earth is my mother and I owe everything to her. That is something that is, is very similar. It's a precept uh, that is, to me, it's, it's, it's very common in indigenous cultures across the Americas, you know, so I've worked with the Algonquin people of Eastern Ontario, um, and now more recently in Northern Canada with a Dene, and uh, the EU East Chi or James Bay Cree. And so this is a notion that comes up time and again. So it was, it was fascinating to learn that in a community like Shwilub and in an environment and geographical region like the Yucatan that is so disconnected seemingly, right, from North America, from Southern Ontario, where I live and work today, that this way of thinking is pretty much the same, you know, these ideas that were expressed to me by elders and by knowledge keepers and uh, by uh, other people's, uh, other people in, in Shwilub in that community, they're virtually the same as the cultural precepts and knowledges that I learned from my father and my grandmother. Uh, and so those knowledges that were passed down generation to generation in Wandat culture. So to me, it was fascinating because the people in Shwilub, for instance, I interviewed, um, one elder and so he asked me you know where do you where do you come from and so i said well i come from canada and so the elder uh you know paused to think for a second and then he said oh yeah canada isn't that about a two-hour drive north of mexico city <laughs> you know, so i mean i mean it just goes to show you that this person had absolutely no knowledge of canada of the indigenous peoples of Canada, or, you know, if you look at me, it's, it's not evident that I'm an indigenous person, right? So, uh, and yet to hear these same precepts and knowledges and this responsibility-based thinking in action in land use activities uh, as indigenous peoples in Canada and in other parts of, of the Americas, to me, that was 
quite illuminating, right? It was, it was fascinating to see that uh, there's a common, there's a way of thinking, there's um, an epistemology and ontology in the Americas that is common to, I would say, virtually all Indigenous peoples of the American continent, you know, whether they're aware of one another or not, which is incredibly fascinating. It really shows that there was this widespread knowledge exchange that took place in the Americas prior to the arrival of Europeans. Uh, there was exchange of knowledges, um, even technology, uh, crops, for instance. One example I like to use is that my own ancestors, the Wandat people, were the farmers of the north. You know, we were the farmers of southern Ontario between Lake Ontario and Georgian Bay. And over the uh, over uh, millennia and centuries, the milpa-based agricultural system that is native to the Yucatan and southern Mexico made its way, you know, slowly up north and all the way to southern Ontario. So the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, that's the same agricultural system that's uh, currently still in place in the Yucatan. And it's been practiced for over 5,000 years, you know, since the development of corn as a crop for uh, human consumption. So just one example of this widespread knowledge, knowledge exchange that took place from north to south, east to west, uh, through the millennia here in the Americas, you know, and, and we were disconnected and isolated from the known world or the old world until 1492. So that's why to me, it's, it's we have to recognize that there's such richness here in uh, the American continent, in the Americas. There's a way of thinking that was better preserved here not because indigenous peoples have a special relationship with God or with the creator, or because we're inherently uh, morally or ethically, you know, superior to other cultures around the world and European cultures included. It's because of this geographical disconnectedness, this isolation from the rest of the world until 1492, we were able to develop, develop uh, modes of thinking and being and doing and living that are completely different from other models that exist around the world you know so uh, to me it was fascinating really to discover that in my research with uh, the maya um not necessarily discovered that but i think one other takeaway from this research is that in canada most indigenous cultures and communities were not connected to the same level uh, as maya communities to the land, you know, we've lost that connection. We don't depend on the land on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, for instance, I can speak for myself. I live in uh, Kitchener. I live in the city, you know, I don't have this, this daily connection or reminder of, uh, of this relationship, this sacred relationship with our earth mother, Yatenoha. Even though I understand that on an intellectual, on a spiritual level, I don't get to practice that, that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but in the Yucatan, there's still, and really in, in South America, and uh, I mean, in, in the, the Southern part of North America as well, so Mexico, and then uh, the Central American countries, there's still, you know, those land-based practices are still in practice. They're still uh, being carried out by members of these indigenous communities. And that's something that we've lost, unfortunately, uh, to a large extent here in the North, you know, in the US and in Canada for, I mean, for reasons outside of our control, right? Because of colonialism and the legacies of colonialism and um, assimilation policies by uh, colonial governments as well. So it's really not our fault, but at the same time, I have to recognize that, you know, as an indigenous scholar, that there's much to learn for me in Latin America, you know, because of these factors and also strength in numbers, you know. In the Yucatan, Maya people represent about a quarter to a third of the population. So that's over 500,000 people, all speaking the same language, you know, and uh, who um, are carrying out the same land use activities, milpa farming, um, apiculture, cattle ranching. So you visit any Ejido or any village in the Yucatan, and you'll find that the same land use activities are um, in practice, you know, by people there. Uh, and that's something that, unfortunately, we don't have here in the north, you know. Um, I mean, even if in northern Canada, uh, where there's a little bit more of that connection with the land and people depend on the land for sustenance, it's not on the same level as for instance, in a Yucatec Maya community where people need to work, you know, the land, they need to carry out these, uh, these land use activities in order to survive. You know, that's, uh, there's, their sustenance comes from that connection with their, their mother, the earth.
And so it's illuminating for a Northern indigenous scholar like me to be able to witness that. And through this process, I learned more about my own culture. You know, I discovered more about how the ideas that I grew up discussing with my father and my grandmother and others uh, in my, my Huron Wendat nation are actually put into practice today. You know, so talking to Amaya Milpero, in a sense, it reminded me, it was almost like talking to one of my own Huron ancestors because they would have practiced the same agricultural system here in Southern Ontario, you know, that originally came from Mexico. So there's that connection also between me as a Wandat scholar and uh, a Yucatec Maya person and the Yucatec Maya culture. And so uh, those are all things that I discovered. I mean, to me, it was uh, incredibly, uh, uh, really life-changing, uh, I, I could say, you know, uh, these things that I learned through my research. So the great circle of uh, peoples of the Yucatan also is, is one of the takeaways from this research. Um, and uh, so how, how much time do I have left? Uh, maybe I'm going a little over the, the limit. Well, you know, it, it's a little over, but, you know, we're pretty flexible here. And, you know, everything you say is interesting. I, I might just... Um, ask you one quick question just to start a discussion and that is why the maya and why Tulev? uh so interesting how did you end up there and then how did you introduce yourself around because you know this research happened over years you went there many times you forged all kinds of relationships you actually worked the land with people there so you know how did this come about mm -hmm. no that's a very good question um so I should mention my, so my, my father, you know, is Huron Wandat and my mother is, is uh, from Colombia, also with indigenous um, ancestry. And so I grew up speaking Spanish as well. So French and Spanish are my, my ah. first languages. And so it was always my intention to do, do my PhD research in Latin America, because I knew so much about the Canadian context and about the Wandat people and the Algonquin and other, you know, other, other peoples of uh, indigenous peoples in Canada, but I wanted to investigate these questions around indigenous environmental philosophy, uh, indigenous land use, uh, sorry, indigenous um, uh, resource management, land governance. I wanted to investigate those questions in a completely different geographical, linguistic, and cultural context, you know, to see if there were any similarities, dissimilarities, and so on and so forth, you know. So uh, I wasn't targeting the Maya per se, you know, so my goal was to really do this this research in anywhere, anywhere in Latin America. You know, so it could have been with the Maya or, um, or you know, the Aymara or any other indigenous group in Latin America. So it just so happened that I crossed paths with my uh, the person who would become my doctoral supervisor, Dr. Derek Smith, at Carleton University, and he had already been doing research with the people of Shwilub for a few years, you know, prior to my doctoral research. So he had established respectful research partnerships and relationships with community members there. Uh, and he's a participatory mapping specialist. And so I'm not really a GIS, you know, kind of mapping person, but it just shows his commitment to indigenous research methodologies and to engaging local communities. He was really keen on um, having me on board, you know, as part of his his broader shirk uh, research project, and so he introduced me to the Shwilub community, and um, you know, so I, I accompanied him on the first couple of trips. I didn't do research uh, for my own my own PhD. Uh, it was more just establishing these these relationships and meeting the people there, and so I could get to know them and they could get to know me. And, you know, this is in line with indigenous research methodologies. It takes a lot of time to develop these, these respectful research partnerships and relationships. And so um, that's how I ended up actually doing research with the Yucatec Maya. So it wasn't um, a lifelong goal to do research with that particular group per se, but uh, you know, I had my sights set on Latin America. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, it fell in line really nicely. So yeah. we already have questions, Miguel, and um, yeah. I, I, I wanted to follow up what you just said with a question from Stephanie, who said, you know, I'm really curious about your thoughts on how non-Indigenous researchers can take seriously the notion of land as sacred. This seems to be an issue that most scholars skirt around. You know, and I think that's a great question because it gets at at several themes in your book. Mm -hmm. No, that's an excellent question. Thank you, Stephanie. 
Um, so I would approach this question by, by saying that I think that both Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people in Canada and elsewhere have become alienated, isolated from, from our Earth mother, our Yatenoha, you know, so in one dot, in, in the mind of a one dot thinker, our Yatenoha is what unites us all, you know, Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Um, she is our first mother, you know, she's known as our first mother. And the reason for that is that, you know, um, all the, the people here today on this, on this call, uh, we all have different biological mothers, right? So we, we're not related that way biologically, but we are related to our, I mean, I mean what, what unites us all, what connects us all is our earth mother, Yatenoha. So before we can start to reconcile with one another as indigenous and non-indigenous people, I, I, I don't use the term settler personally, you know, and that's because I consider that we're all connected through our Yatenoha, you know, we all relate to her. And this is not just some, philosophical construct or you know some spiritual teaching we we all <laughs> relate with the earth you know because we depend on the earth for our sustenance for our day-to-day -day survival you know so it's not that far-fetched to think in those terms you know so that brings me to another point that there's um there's such inherent value in indigenous ways of thinking about the land uh so I mean, it's, we tend to think about Indigenous knowledges as spiritual teachings or things that aren't really grounded in the practical and the concrete, but that's definitely not the case. You know, if we look at uh, the origin of these, these legends, these stories, these teachings that are passed down generation, generation to, uh, to generation, it's all based on survival. You know, it's based on being able to perpetuate our cultures from generation to generation. So uh, just a side note about uh, the value of indigenous knowledge is not only for our own cultures, but for the rest of humanity and for the planet. Uh, but I was saying that, you know, we have lost this connection to our earth mother, our Yatenoha, before we can begin to reconcile with one another, in order to embark on a, a more meaningful, a deeper process of reconciliation, we have to learn to be part of the land where we live, where we work today. We have to learn to reconcile with our, our first mother, you know, with our Yatenoha. And so that means learning about the land from indigenous cultures that are local to the area in which you live. It necessitates this process of, of reaching out, you know, of, of learning, of, of, of reaching out in a respectful fashion, of creating and establishing relationships and connections with the indigenous cultures that are native to the area where you live. So this is how we can start to, to, to um, consider the earth or the land as sacred again, you know, uh, it's through this reconciliation with our earth mother before we can, before we can start to meaningfully reconcile uh, indigenous and non-indigenous peoples you know so i think that's a first step it, it could include learning uh, a few words in the local indigenous language you know so um i learned a few words in in yucatec maya and that was my way of connecting with the land of grounding myself and of respecting the sacredness of the area of the land where i was doing my research you know so i think that i i bring that approach with me wherever i go whether it's england Portugal, China, or the Yucatan. There's a culture that is native to every single area in the world, you know, and uh, what better way to learn about the sacredness, about these connections, these relationships, than to learn from the native peoples themselves, the indigenous peoples themselves. So I guess that's my, um, that's my kind of philosophical answer. I, I realize it's, uh, I didn't say anything very practical, but I think it's important to think about these conceptual uh, considerations, you know, before we can begin to actually put into practice uh, uh, this approach. So. You know, and that's that's what I would say is is one of the the big contributions of this book uh, that I think I, I think there's a real gap in uh, how we talk about environmental management in all the various literatures that we don't know how to work at the interface between indigenous knowledge systems about 
the environment and human systems, and then the more conventional reductionist Western approaches, right? So, you know, you, you said that's philosophical, and yet in, in your answer, you, you started giving some practical guidance about how to do that. But I think one of the things about this book is that it starts to talk about how to do this. And, you know, you say at the very beginning that this is very important to you. And one of the reasons you wrote the book is bringing these two together in a, in a really grounded way so that we start doing, you know, environmental management differently. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And maybe to follow up on that uh, notion, you know, um, I think you mentioned groundedness and, um, and I mentioned citizenship and, and belonging to a democracy, a greater democracy. You know, that's one of the things I learned in, in Shuilub. Um, so we, you know, we take for granted as Canadian citizens that we belong to the Canadian economy, political system. You know, we, we belong to the Canadian democracy, which is a philosophical construction, right? Uh, yeah. It's not something that we can tangibly see or feel or, or, or touch or taste. You know, we can't. It's not something that that exists out there that we can independently kind of you know uh, look at. Uh, yet we have such a problem. We have such difficulty as researchers, as politicians, everyone basically. We have such a, a difficult time imagining or understanding that we belong to the land. You know, we belong to the great democracy of peoples, the great circle of peoples that plays out on the land indefinitely. And that's something that is material, concrete, observable, and real. Uh, that's what sustain, sustains us on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, so if we take for granted that we're Canadian citizens and we go out and vote every four years, you know, and, and we belong to this philosophical construction, really, it's not something that actually exists, then it shouldn't be that much of a leap to consider that we belong to something that actually sustains us, you know, which is the land. So. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to, um, there's some questions kind of piling in and I want to recognize Aaron and Carla, your, the questions that you put in the chat. Miguel, if you want to just uh, take a look at the chat as well. Sure. But I also want to see if people want to ask their questions themselves. So Scott, Scott, just to follow up on what you were just saying, I think his question is apropos what you're just talking about. Scott, maybe you want to ask your question yourself because it talks about how do we actually you know, bring those worldviews together here where we are, well, if here in Waterloo. <laughs> oh, I think you're still muted. No, I was telling people around oh. me that I was unmuting so that they, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that I would be going on, on the call. Um, yeah, thank you. And Miguel and I have already, have, have talked about this already. So I have, any chance that I get to hear you speak about this, and I'm looking forward to reading your book as well. Um, I, I, I take my every opportunity to, to hear you speak about this. Um, yeah, so my question was just around uh, how do we, uh, what did I say? <laughs> uh, yeah, so how do we, what do you see as opportunities, especially here on the Grand River watershed for uh, some of that practical knowledge exchange between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people? Around, and my, my interest is, is particularly on uh, transition in energy systems to be more sustainable, but then there's also food systems. Like I was fascinated by the, the three sisters. You mentioned that the three sisters kind of migrated from the Yucatan to here on the, here on Wendat, Wendat territory. So um, anyway, would love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. So, Thank, thank you, Scotty. I really appreciate uh, your your words. Um, so, in terms of opportunities for uh, practical knowledge exchange, I think is uh, the essence of your your question. There's, you know, th these days there's so many organizations and and groups. There's the Land Back Camp. There's um, even uh, those of you who've participated in um, in Elder Marianne Cabellosi's water walks, you know, on the Grand River. There's opportunities like that to connect, you know, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples and, and to learn more about sacred responsibilities to one's environment, to the land here around us in the Grand River watershed, right? And, um, you know, even, I think, so unfortunately, you know, the, and almost tragically, um, here on the one that language is is a dead language for all intents and purposes, right? So, uh, so and this is for a number of reasons. You know, we had to migrate from southern Ontario uh, all the way to our present day location near Quebec City, 
um, in the late 1600s after being decimated by wars and disease, you know, between the, the English and the French over the control of this part of the world. But anyway, um, so we lost our language. So one of my, my goals really right now is to learn um, the Mohawk language, which is the most similar to the Wandat language, you know, out of all the, the Haudenosaunee uh, Six Nations languages. And because I, I feel like I need to learn about how Indigenous peoples that are native to this part of the world, you know, northern New York State, southern Ontario, the Haudenosaunee, the Wandat, how they understood, how they understand the land around them. You know, I think that that learning words in an Indigenous language is so important because you, you really uh, you, you get a sense of, of how to reconcile with the land, how to reconcile with one another, how, you know, what kinds of activities are constitute responsible land use as opposed to irresponsible land use, you know, so you learn that way of thinking that cultural lens through these languages, you know, so, um, and I know there's language programs in the areas, you know, there's Anishinaabe uh, and other and, and, and possibly, I believe, you know, some uh, Haudenosaunee uh, nation languages as well, that uh, there's courses that are being offered uh, in, in the Grand River watershed region, I guess you could say. Uh, so I think that's very important as well in terms of, of, um, of this knowledge exchange, you know, it's important to be able to understand the people with whom we're dialoguing. And a great way to do that is to I'm not saying we have to become fluent in an in indigenous language, but even learning, you know, the word for sky or tree or land, you know, so these are all very key things, I think. And um, it, it, it demonstrates as also that you're approaching uh, these issues, you know, from, uh, from a respectful position, you know, you're extending, um, your your hand in a respectful manner and uh, and with an openness and a willingness to learn from indigenous cultures that have evolved here that have developed here in the Grand River watershed for millennia and that have really learned to love this land as their own mother right so I think that hopefully that <laughs> that somewhat answers your question I'm glad to talk a little bit more about that Scott so I'm sorry if I don't have a, <laughs> a very good answer at this point. So just uh, again, I'm still jumping around here, but Tanya posed a really interesting question about the word, the Maya word for responsibility. And she said, you know, can you, um, Tanya, I hope it's okay if I speak for you, <laughs> you know, can you talk a little bit more about that word and, and, and kind of how, it, what it means, how it's used and how it's different from our understanding of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to risk, um, uh, giving you the, the incorrect word. I have it in my notes um, and I don't want to mispronounce it either. So, you know, in my interviews, I don't speak Maya, right? So I had a translator from the community who translated from Maya into Spanish, which I speak, you know, and I understand. So, you know, unfortunately, most of the time I got the word responsabilidad, right? So that was the, the translation. So, and that's, you know, one of the limitations of this kind of research when you're dealing with multiple languages, you know, and publishing a book in English, uh, whereas the original language in most of these discussions was Maya and then Spanish and then English, you know, so there's, I'm sure there's a lot that was lost, you know, in, in, in this translate, this cultural translation, right, in addition to linguistic translation. Um, but in terms of responsibility, um, that's a very good question. And uh, maybe to give you a direct insight into how a Maya person conceives of, you know, responsibility and what this means in practice. I have a quote that I want to uh, read to you from one particular milpero, and it goes to show you how this responsibility, how the, the, the Maya, the, the milpa-based agricultural system is the linchpin of Maya culture, identity, and responsibility as well. Everything revolves around the milpa, you know, in Maya culture. So I have a quote from Juan Milpero. We were talking about climate change and drought and the desiccation of, uh, of the land in the Yucatan that's uh, been, you know, that's been, um, uh, that's been speeding up really over the last few years. You know, it's, it's unfortunately just like in other regions around the world, right? Climate change is one of the most significant environmental challenges and problems with which we're faced. And so we were talking about climate change and what this means in terms of the ability of Maya people to carry out their sacred responsibilities and duties to the land, 
uh, in future generations. And so I'll read to you what he said about that. So he says, well, to me, the earth means a lot. In the past, when I used to work on my milpa, the harvest was plentiful. The earth provided my family and I with food to sustain us, but things have changed too much. Now, when it's the rainy season and we're expecting rain, it doesn't rain, nothing. Many corn plants that I recently planted are dying because of too much heat and sun. And so this is where he gets to, you know, the responsibility. So in terms of, so what are you going to do about all of this? You know, so he says, but even though I'm old, I have a great deal of respect and love for the land. And I continue to carry out my Maya work. I don't foresee a time when I'll stop working on the milpa because I'm so used to the work and I will always carry the work deep within me. So maybe I'll die on my milpa working. You know, so... Uh, I mean, I think that quote kind of beautifully encapsulates what responsibility means to a Maya person, right? So this um, this uh, notion that that this person is doesn't matter what's going on around him uh, in terms of these changes going on, climate change, uh, the fact that more and more young people are having to find jobs outside of their communities, you know, in order to uh, to sustain their families economically. Uh, so, you know, it, it demonstrates that whatever happens, perhaps I'll die on my field, you know, working. So it's, it's hard to fathom in, in the Western sense of the word, you know, this dimension of responsibility to the land. I think that this quote, it really encapsulates that and, uh, it transmits that notion, you know, quite beautifully to me. Um, it's really difficult to understand. I, at least in my estimation, in, in according to our Western understanding of, of responsibility and our relationship, the relationship between human beings and the environment, you know. So hopefully that begins to answer your question, but I, I could talk about this for hours and hours. So, but thank you, Tanya. Hopefully that uh, starts pointing you in the, you know, right direction. Great. Thanks to both of you. Carla, you know, one of the interesting things about the book that I really noticed, Miguel, is that you make the point that the rights-based discourse uh, relating to Indigenous peoples um, has been important in terms of uh, sort of uh, interfacing with or addressing state and corporate forces that have global impacts. And Carla, I think you wanted to sort of ask a question about the global reach of some of what Miguel is doing here. And we're having a hard time uh, yeah. hearing you, Carla. Would it be possible to turn up a little bit? Um, can you hear me now? Uh, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> Try shouting. <laughs> um, okay, I will. I'm not sure if this is any That's better. better. Yes. <laughs> okay, it's a microphone issue. Uh, I wanted to say thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Miguel. Uh, this has been a really uh, interesting conversation so far. Um, yeah, I asked this question um, because we're in a global governance uh, program and uh, rights-based language is used often in um, you know, global forums and that sort of thing. So I was curious if you saw any relationship between rights-based tools such as UN DRIP um, and Indigenous environmental stewardship. Mm -hmm. um, and especially given uh, the responsibility-based thinking that your research has centered um, so strongly. And I also ask this question um, because I work um, in a UN organization that includes many indigenous peoples from the North Americas um, and they are using some of these tools. And so I just wanted to see if you had any um, thoughts on some of this. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, in terms of uh, this, this tension or, or um, you know, between responsibility and rights-based frameworks and, and ways of thinking, I think that uh, I should make it clear that I'm not in any way trying to diminish uh, the, the role or the importance of rights-based frameworks, you know. What my research tries to bring attention to is the fact that rights and well the whole concept of rights is foreign to indigenous cultures of the americas you know so we have to keep that in mind when we deal with indigenous cultures and and they're compelled to to speak about their rights and you know territorial and land governance 
that's a discourse that is necessary today in 2021 in order to protect indigenous sovereignty and so these days we need rights of course you know i'm not i'm not trying to say that we that we should do away with this whole notion and concept of rights that's definitely not the case we we absolutely need rights uh, in terms of of, uh, of i think the role of these frameworks like undrip um and uh and other such you know legal documents international policy documents uh, pertaining to Indigenous rights is that we need them in order to secure uh, and to to safeguard Indigenous responsibilities to the land, you know. So I think that both can work together very well. We need to protect Indigenous rights in order for Indigenous peoples to be able to carry out their sacred duties and responsibilities to the land without losing sight of the fact that Indigenous peoples don't relate to one another uh, at least historically speaking, traditionally speaking, in these terms. You know, nobody uh, prior to the arrival of, of Europeans was talking about my, my, my human rights, you know, my uh, individual rights, my collective rights, my rights as a man, my rights as a woman. Like, that's not how we operated. That's not how we related to one another. And of course, now in present day Canada and Mexico and uh, other democracies around the world, of course, that's how we relate to one another. That's how our societies are organized. So we need, of course, we need rights. We need to uh, continue to, to fight for indigenous rights. Uh, but I think that the purpose of that is to, again, protect Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous language, and to make sure that Indigenous cultures can teach us the essence of their way of thinking, you know, it can teach us lessons that Western cultures have been so um, resistant to, uh, you know, have, have resisted learning these lessons, have been so... Um, I mean, it's been like two solitudes, Indigenous knowledges and Western knowledges, you know, and so... Uh, I think that we have much to learn from Indigenous cultures, languages, uh, our way of relating with the environment, and we need we need uh, rights. We need Indigenous rights, and we need to have them protected, and um, you know we need to uphold these rights as well. Um, so, hope, right, hopefully, that's you. yeah. So, Aaron, did you want to ask your question? Hi, yes, sure. <laughs> um, I forget what it was. Hang on one second. There it is. Um, first of all, Miguel, uh, now go for your words. This has been really wonderful. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wondered if you could speak to a little bit to your favorite part of working with the people down there. Um, as much as the, you know, the technical part of researching with Indigenous peoples is really fun and important, I want to hear the good stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. No, I appreciate it because that's the best part of this research, right? I mean, it definitely uh, I mean, is, and I'm so excited to hear it. Yeah, and and you understand that. So, so uh, my favorite part of this was relationship building, right? And and honoring the Yucatan. You know, I consider uh, the the Maya people and and the families, you know, with whom I, I lived and worked uh, in during my time there. I consider them my my second family, and I consider the Yucatan my my second home. You know, my my second Yatenoha, Earth Mother, right? And so, probably my favorite part about all of this was um, developing uh, relationships with the younger younger people in uh, in Shuilub. And uh, so, one thing I did to engage the community and to kind of share and to give back uh, was I asked them, you know, I'm a university researcher from Canada, you know, I have a certain skill set, some things that I could, I bring to the table, you know, uh, how do you think I could be the most useful to your community, you know, to, to the people here? And so the leadership said, hey, like, you speak English, right? So why don't you teach our kids English? And um, so I said, of, of course, that's so sounds like sounds like fun. Sure. So what I did, uh, this was during, I think, two, well, two research trips out of um, out of the four, you know, actual research trips. I taught English to elementary school and high school kids uh, for it was like three weeks, like 21 days in a row uh, each trip, you know, and so I, I developed connections with the kids and I'm a former baseball player as well and baseball is you know the national sport in the Yucatan it's the so the Maya don't play soccer they play baseball so every day after class I would play baseball with the kids and uh, you know then I would um, 
just hang out with them. And I think, you know, th th of course, I learned so much from the elders and from my interviews and, and working with them on the land. Uh, but, you know, working with, with kids and youths and, um, and developing those relationships with them, I think it was the most gratifying part of uh, my research, you know. And um, yeah, I really miss them. And uh, I wish I could go back <laughs> now, but, uh, but uh, you know, so hopefully when things get back to a relative normal, I'll be able to uh, go back. So uh, I even brought my, um, my parents there for Christmas and New Year's. You know, that was, it's part of indigenous research, right? It's building these connections. It's uh, relating to one another on familial terms. You know, I have sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles there. Uh, and the elders there are my elders as well. I've learned so much from them. And so this, this is what I think this is a, an approach that is needed. And it, it, I don't think that, um, that it's limited to indigenous scholars. I think that non-indigenous scholars can learn to develop similar relationships with indigenous people. You know, it's, it's, it's really about humanity and connecting to one another, you know, and, and learning that no matter how hard we try to be objective scientific researchers, we all have our personal biases. We were all brought up in a certain cultural environment, familial environment. Uh, we all have our, our preconceptions, our, our prejudices, and we have to embrace those, you know, and, and make that part of the research process. And how, that's how we connect to, uh, to ind indigenous research partners on a human level, you know, on a, based on, on respect and reciprocity and uh, and relating to the land and the people, as I said, in familial terms, you know, so the land is our mother and the people there as our family members as well as our extended family. You know? So um, that's the kind of approach that I, I um, that, that that informs my research all over the world, you know, so that's how I relate with uh, indigenous peoples across the Americas and non indigenous peoples too, you know, so that's how I learned to think that's, you know, the indigenous way of thinking, the one that way of thinking that, and, and I know no other way uh, to do things, you know, so, yeah. So and, uh, we've got, oh, oh sorry, Aaron. We just, oh, that's okay. I was just saying, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, um, we have two more questions, one from Scott, one from Stephanie. Stephanie's builds on Scott. So why don't you both unmute? Scott, ask your question and then Stephanie follow up and then Miguel can take it away because then we can have a little bit of a, you know, a little more interaction. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, yeah, my question was just about this idea of uh, granting legal personhood to Big Grand River watershed. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's been done in some other areas and it, it kind of builds on, on Carla's earlier question about rights frameworks and using those to, like you said, um, uh, protect the ability of Indigenous peoples to carry out their own sacred responsibilities and hopefully non-indigenous folks would learn from some of that as well um anyway would love to hear your thoughts and then stephanie you had you built on the question thanks scott could you could you repeat just the the first part of the question i think i, I missed that actually um oh yeah it was about uh what your thoughts on the idea of of granting legal personhood to the grand river watershed and it, it, like i think of that place because i'm on it but, you know, maybe your experience in Yucatan would be, um, you know, maybe there's something analogous to that there. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And should I piggyback on that right now? Go for it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So to, to extend that, um, I know last month, I think it was the Six Nations traditional government um, uh, requested a moratorium or declared a moratorium on development in the Haldeman Tract. And... I'm curious what insights you have on kind of putting that into action. A moratorium on development? Across the, across the Haldeman Tract. And how I would bring that into action? Um, how, how, how all of us might, uh, might make that happen one day. <laughs> it's quite a grand vision. Um, yeah, there's a link in the chat there because it came out just a minute in, um, yeah. Late, late April, uh, that the traditional governments in the Six Nations are asking, they want a moratorium on development in the Haldeman track. Um, and I haven't heard much more than this CBC piece. And I think something similar on the 1492 land back lane site. Um, so I'm curious what, I mean, maybe others on the call have, have insights as well. 
Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, I'm a little unsure about how to answer this this question. Have the Six Nations proposed anything? You know, I, I'm I'm not really aware of uh, of this plan here or this uh, this proposal. So, fair enough. Can just it, just yeah. jump to Scott's question. Okay, sorry about that, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, so Scott's question, Scott, your question was about um, the um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> legal. Yeah, no, we're we're throwing oh, a lot at you. The legal, legal person. Yeah. I mean, I think that would be a, a a very important first step. You know, I think that it would probably it would be. Um, a landmark development, you know, in terms of, uh, of relearning, rediscovering our responsibilities to the land. And I think, uh, as I was explaining to Carla, I think that these legalistic mechanisms and frameworks, I think that in, in these cases and contexts, they can prove to be very useful, right? Uh, even though, um, so, and this is one thing that uh, I, you know, I'm very happy uh, that is happening and it's that, Indigenous, sorry, non-Indigenous or Western environmental thinking over the last few decades has been moving closer and closer to these traditional notions of uh, land governance, these Indigenous notions of land governance and responsibility-based thinking. So even though it's it's not there yet, I mean, it's it's clearly not there yet, but I think that through these legalistic frameworks and uh, and um, granting environmental personhood to uh, features of the landscape or like a river or a watershed or an ecosystem even, I think that that's a step in the right direction. And I think that it has to be done in conjunction with indigenous peoples, you know, to inform that whole process um, because there's there's more to legal personhood. I think there's another dimension um, and we have to keep the responsibilities and duties in mind as well. So um, if we simply have protection, you know, for this, for the Grand River watershed or the Wanganui River in New Zealand without the attendant responsibility or duty that comes with it, I think we're missing half of the picture, you know, because rights does not mean protection uh, rights does not mean responsibility necessarily, you know? So that's why I think that it, it would be great. I mean, uh, that's, like I said, a step in the right direction, but it has to be done in close partnership with Indigenous peoples like the Haudenosaunee and other groups in the area, you know, the Mississauga that are that are informing the process at every step of the way, I think. So, yeah. So Miguel, we're running out of time, but I would like to ask you um, about um, you know, some of your current projects, because you're pulling this forward into several other realms. And I'm sure that people on the call would be interested in knowing about some of these other projects and, and what you're studying. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So in terms of my other projects, I have three um, current projects. So one is in the Decho region of the Northwest Territories. And it's, it focuses on permafrost thaw and developing a Dene-led approach to permafrost and climate change, permafrost thaw and climate change adaptation and mitigation based on the Dene language laws and values. You know, so prior scientific research that's been done in the Decho region about um, climate change or permafrost thaw, it's really failed to take into consideration these Dene values and Dene um, knowledges about the changing environment. And I think that that's something that has to uh, change, you know, so I've been working in close partnership with DFN, uh, the Decho First Nations, uh, in an attempt to really develop a framework for this Indigenous-led climate change adaptation um, uh, strategy, you know, in the Decho. And so most of my work uh, these days in terms of um, uh, my research with Indigenous peoples in Northern Canada, like I said, the Dene and the Cree, and also the um, Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Ojibwe people in Northern Ontario. It has to do with indigenous environmental stewardship, um, with uh, indigenous guardians programs and how uh, we can, mm -hmm, how we can really turn our attention from, again, like these, these legalistic uh, 
mechanisms and frameworks to more of these responsibility-based values uh, that are inherent in these cultures in Northern Canada and uh, what we can learn from that for the benefit of not only those individual First Nations, but all of Canada and, and the world really. You know, I think that we're developing new approaches um, that are based on these Indigenous values because if, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's emerging research in terms of that, that demonstrates that if you fail to take into consideration Indigenous knowledges in climate change adaptation and mitigation programs, uh, they're doomed to fail really. You know, there's mounting evidence in that regard. And so I think that it's it's paramount, you know, it's vital to not only include these knowledges, but to make sure that our whole approach is, is based on these Indigenous frameworks, you know, in order to increase the likelihood that they'll be successful and sustainable in the long term. You know? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I work with the Decho First Nations on permafrost thaw and climate change adaptation mitigation, also with the um, Ojibwe in Northern Ontario on water stewardship and the James Bay Cree, also very broadly on environmental uh, and land governance approaches, you know, in the EU East G territory in Northern Quebec, which is the first, uh, the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement was the first modern treaty in the history of Canada, signed in 1975 by the Inuit, the Cree, and the government of Quebec. So, um, you know, so that's kind of uh, in a nutshell what I'm doing these days. And I try to bring the same approach that I used in my uh, in my research with the Yucatec Maya. So mm -hmm. I wish I was a student in one of your classes. <laughs> Just Thank a you. final, final, final quick question. And I mean, it's a, it's actually a very big question, but uh, you know, there's a lot of non-Indigenous researchers and I think, and some of them are on this call, um, who would like to be seriously engaged in the kinds of things that you talked to us about today. What advice can you give uh, what, what advice can you give us for sort of really trying to work this into our own research programs? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, as I've been mentioning, the first step is to include Indigenous peoples from the outset, you know, and at every step of the way, and to make an effort to uh, follow Indigenous research methodologies. So, um, one particular book that I, I found very uh, useful, even for me as an Indigenous scholar, was uh, Margaret Kovacs' book, Indigenous Methodologies, uh, from U of T Press. Also, um, Rene Polani Louis's 2007 article, uh, and of course I'm drawing a blank here. Um, I, I can't remember the, the title, but it, it outlines really four simple steps, you know, the four R's of Indigenous research. And I have a note about that here. So very quickly, I think, uh, so I'll try to find this. this I found the, the Kovacs one and put it in the chat for anybody who's interested. It's great. Okay. And also Decolonizing Methodologies by Linda Smith as well. So I, I, some of you must be familiar with that one. Um, but uh, I'm trying to you know, quickly scroll through this document and find the the note I made about that, about Indigenous research method. I think I have it here. So, and so this is an approach, uh, I'm working with non-Indigenous graduate students these days and they have the same questions, you know, it's just yeah. so, and um, so I always try to get them to read uh, this article by Louis. So the four R's are relational accountability, respectful representation, uh, reciprocal appropriation, and rights and regulation. You know, so I think that she brilliantly outlines these four concrete and actionable steps that can be taken by non-Indigenous and Indigenous researchers to ensure that these Indigenous methodologies are put into practice you know, at every step of the research process. Um, so I think that that's a good introduction. And from there, you know, you can uh, kind of branch out and discover other Indigenous authors as well who've written about um, about those themes, you know, those issues. Great, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us today. We really enjoyed it. I did put a link to Miguel's book uh, in the chat as well. It's wonderful. I, I have to say, I, I told Miguel on email that, you know, I think I had COVID fatigue and for a long time, I haven't been able to really focus on anything like an academic length work. You know, I start reading something and then I, you know, wander all over the place. 
his book is the first one that I actually read cover to cover uh, and, and was really immersed in it. Um, it's a wonderful, very clearly structured and clearly written book um, that makes these you know arguments consistently throughout. So certainly I would highly recommend it. Miguel, we look forward to um, having you involved in the Environment and Resources Research Cluster activities in the future. And thank you so much for today. Um, and one just quick note is that my co-lead, Neil Craig, is organizing a policy workshop for uh, BSIA and university students on May the 26th. We will be sending out some detailed information on that um, momentarily, okay? So stay tuned on that. But thank you for everybody for participating and thanks, Miguel. It's been a pleasure, Deborah. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, you putting together, organizing this event. So thank you everyone as well. Our pleasure. And feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Okay, bye now.